Good morning. Good morning. Uh, so good to be here with the family of the um, family of God, and just, just seeing you uh, praying for one another on Sunday morning just reminded that how wonderful to be the part of the family of the Lord. Um, as you, um, um, he, uh, Pastor Eddie just mentioned, I was born in South Korea. Uh, this is where I grew up, actually. I'm from this area. Uh, and then our family moved to the United States when I was 16. So I was, I was living in the in U.S., but this is when I received calling to be a pastor and missionary later on to China. So I've been wanting to go to China for a long time, but life happened and it didn't happen for a while. And finally I ended up in uh, China 2006. So, I might, so today, because lack of time, I will not be able to share the full story of what happened to me before, while in North Korea, and then now what I'm doing right now. So one of the things that I can um, suggest is that I brought a book for you. Um, it's called Not Forgotten. This is a book that I wrote. Um, the only thing is I only have five English copies. <laughs> so first come, first serve. It'll be in the back. But I do have Korean versions. We, we should have plenty uh, for you if you are able to read Korean. So there are so a lot of stories that I won't be able to tell today it will be in the book. So please uh, take a look at that after the service. Well, um, let me just, I'm going to start with uh, how I was detained in North Korea. 2012, uh, November 3rd, uh, when I crossed into the North Korea, I brought uh, maybe six people with me because uh, I set up the tour company to North, uh, so that we can send, we can bring people to North Korea. Uh, but the people I brought in are Christians, intercessors. I wanted to bring Christians to go to North Korea to pray and worship and love the people of North Korea. And we wanted to, we cannot preach the gospel, we cannot hand over the, the Bible, but as we go walk in there and say, Lord, we claim this land, Lord. May this be the land again, the feel with your people worshiping and honoring you, Lord. So their journey began in 2010, and I brought uh, 300 people to North Korea from 17 different countries, over 23 different trips. So we went to Rajin, uh, which is in the northeast section of, uh, of North Korea. Later on, went to Pyongyang, Gungangsan, all, all over the places. And uh, while we were walking everywhere, we've been praying and worshiping. It was wonderful. Out of 300 people I brought in, about 10 of them became full-time missionaries, now working in and out of North Korea right now. While the world this thing was happening, uh, my last trip, this was my 18th trip, I was detained in North Korea. I was detained in North Korea because I made a crucial mistake by uh, bringing in a portable computer hard drive into the countries as mistakes. It's, it's the size is about this size, a very small. It was in my briefcase. I was hurrying in the morning. I ended up uh, crossing the border with my hard drive in it. This hard drive contained uh, some of the Western media footage about North Korea. It's a documentary films, and they say, why did you bring such a hostile material into our countries? They detained me because of that, but they also found all my mission support letters, everything that I've been doing in chi China and North Korea. They all for pretty much, I say, you know, arrest me. That was my case. Uh, so I was detained in North Korea in 2012, November 3rd. I was taken into uh, security bureaus, um, some, uh, some hideout locations. I was in the middle of nowhere. And they put me in the room. I was questioned from 8 o'clock in the morning until uh, midnight every day for about a month. And they, I only slept two or three hours a day. It was extremely difficult to continue. Um, so on the first day, they um, made me write down the confessions. And they read it. And they say, OK, this is not good enough. So they go stand by the wall. Then I go. Uh, I kind of like a timeout. I was actually facing the wall for maybe a few hours. Say, okay, come back and you can write more. And then go back there again. So second day and third day, they put me on the middle of the room. And they say, stand still. Absolutely stand still. Do not move. Do not talk. And I was uh, all by myself in the room itself. 
I mean, there's a camera somewhere, and so if I move a little bit, because I cannot really stand still like this, uh, but if I move a little bit, they will come in and they'll yell at me and say, do not move. So I had to stand still for maybe three, four, five hours. But something amazing thing that happened that, uh, that day, my back wasn't hurting, my leg wasn't hurting, I wasn't hungry, I wasn't tired, I wasn't even sleepy. I was thinking that, hey, I think I can do this for several weeks if I need to. <laughs> uh, but, you know, my, I was worried, I was panicking. Uh, now, I was, now only I was worried for myself, I was worrying about the people I brought in, are they gonna be okay? Um, and then I was worrying about, you know, because the people that I wrote on my mission support letters, the uh, missionaries and North Koreans and all the people who are involved in our ministry, are they gonna be okay? So I was, I was pretty much literally panicking and I was asking the Lord, where are you, Lord? You've been protecting me, you've been doing everything for me for the last six years, working in China and North Korea, why now? And then suddenly my, I felt like warmth in my hand and it's that, that room was freezing. There was maybe like, uh, uh, you, can, you can tell, maybe a, a 10 degrees Celsius. Uh, the room was very freezing. The first thing they, they did to me is uh, take off your pants. And so I had to, I had like a very thin, long you know, underwear. And that was it, that was what, what I was wearing. It was really, you know, really cold. I'm standing still. Suddenly my hand was getting warm. So I opened my palm, I saw something sparkling like a gold dust. I have no idea what's happening, and the worm starting to spread into my arm. And this is when I, the Lord spoke to me clearly and said, Kenneth, Holy Spirit is holding your hand. I am with you. Do not fear, because I never leave you, never forsake you. And that moment, everything changed. Because suddenly, the Lord, I thought that God has left me. But the Lord said, no, I am with you. Cast all your anxieties upon me because I care for you. He said, no one will be harmed through this, so do not fear, be strong. There is something I will accomplish through this. So I have no idea what's, what's going to happen next, but the only thing I knew is God is with me. And then suddenly the presence of God was so thick in the room, the power of God came over. I was so peaceful. I was started rejoicing, so I must be smiling, you know, in that room. And then they saw me on the camera. I can hear them talking from the other room and say, wait a minute, it's not working. This guy's smiling. <laughs> and then the one of the guards came in and said, just go to bed. You don't need to stand anymore. So uh, while laying down, I realized that, you know, my tears dripping down and say, I thought that I was abandoned, but God said, no, I am with you. But one thing, the guy, he said, I'll be your rescuer. Be strong. But one thing that he didn't say was, but by the way, you're going to be here for another 732 more days. <laughs> <laughs> but if he would have said so, then I probably could not continue or bear. So I guess when, you, when, when the Bible talks about God will not give you anything more than you can handle, but maybe it means like he, now, he will not tell you anything more than you can handle as well. <laughs> so next day, I realized that people I brought in were able to leave the country safely. And then so I said, okay, now is the time for me to tell the truth. And I told them, the reason why I brought people to North Korea is to pray and worship. And that's what I've done. And this is what the North Korean government's official said. You know you have, what you have done? You have done something very, very uh, serious here. Serious crime you have committed. And then he said, who sent you? I said, God. <laughs> who is above you? God. I said, he said, beside God, who else is there? I said, nobody. And a few days, we've been, you know, a few days we were going back and forth. And later on, finally, they said, you know what? You have violated our law. You tried to overthrow our government. I said, what do you mean I, try, I was trying to overthrow your government? How did I do that? And he said, through prayer and worship. <laughs> and I said, excuse me, you don't believe in God. Why do you believe in prayer? <laughs> you have more faith than most of Christians do. 
Because for many of us say, we pray what's going to happen in North Korea. We pray, but what's going to happen to the church unifications? But it seems like because I brought 300 people to North Korea so, uh, to pray and worship inside, now you're accusing me that I was trying to overthrow the government. You have more faith than most of Christians do. And later on, they found out there is actually one North Korean lady who uh, took a discipleship training school in China, DTS. And, and then uh, she was with us for one year. She went back to North Korea to start an orphanage. And then they found her. I was so worried about her safety. But later on, I realized that she was actually pardoned by the government. She was living okay because of me. She was questioned again. Later on, she became a witness against me on my trial. She was able to go home. So, but I wanted to defend her because I didn't know what was going to happen at the time. So I say, she was trying to start an orphanage in North Korea, but she couldn't start one. Why is it a crime against the state? This is what they said. One person become Christian, come back and start an orphanage with 10 children. 10 will become Christians. 10 will become 100, 100 will become 10,000 someday. When that happens, do you think they're going to be a threat to us or not? And then I say, maybe. <laughs> and I say, see, what you have done is you inject us Christian virus into our countries and the virus will spread and they will be infected and then there, there were people who will lose a heart to follow Juche which is self-reliance and follow the system and then the leader and then you, this will become a God's countries. When he said that I felt like it was God spoke to me directly. <laughs> yes one person can change the nations when we pray Prayer can transform the nation like North Korea. And they put me, uh, they took me to uh, Pyongyang and they said, you are going to be charged uh, and you were facing death penalty or life in prison. You will never be able to return home. I was sent to uh, Pyongyang and uh, daily I was questioned by um, uh, the prosecutors, the North Korean prosecutors. And uh, they, uh, all the morning and the afternoons, you know, just uh, all day long, I have to sit in the chairs. Uh, sometimes they come in, sometimes they don't come in. So I asked them, can I have my Bible back? So they actually gave back my Bible. So guess what? Me know I, I was reading the Bible all the time. So I read more Bible in North Korea than any other time in my life. <laughs> and I, I pray more, I worship more. One of the charge against me was I was trying to start a prayer center in North Korea. And I was in Pyongyang and in National Security Bureau's you know, safe home. I was there worshiping, praying, Lord, this is your prayer house. Where I'm praying and praying and asking the Lord for intervention because on the third day, he said, I'll be your rescuers. And I was praying and praying, but at the time, the things are not going so well because uh, North Korea did a third nuclear testing. They were about to have war with the United States. I was the only American in custody, and they were getting, uh, they were getting mad at me. And they say, if you don't cooperate, we'll just take you out on the street and just shoot tomorrow. And I'll cut off your head somewhere, and no one will find your body. And those kind of... Um, you know, accuse you know, those kind of you know that's pretty much threat was made uh, you know periodically, but the Lord continued to say through the Bible, through Isaiah, Psalm, and say, "I'll be a rescuer. I'm I'm the rock and I'm the refuge, and wait for the Lord." So one day I was sitting in the chair, and then I was thinking about I was craving Pyongyang naengmyeon, <laughs> yeah, you know, cold noodle soup. And I said, wow, well, I've been here three times. I went to Ongnyuga, Ongnyuga, and I had a great naengmyeon. But I cannot ask that, can I have naengmyeon, please? And, you know, <laughs> and I'm, in, I'm in like detention center, you know. And um, they, they said, oh, they're about to take me out and shoot. And I said, well, at least can, can I have favor, a dying man's favor? But I couldn't do that. I was just smiling. I was in pray. But next day, they served Pyongyang naengmyeon for lunch. <laughs> and I was like, wow, this is great. So next day I was sitting in the chair and I was, this time I was craving kimchi bokkeumbap, you know, kimchi fried rice. And I was thinking about it, I didn't pray. But that evening kimchi fried rice was served. <laughs> it was like a bizarre, you know. But it only happened a couple of times, this is you know, coincidence. But it happened more than 40 times within the four and a half months before the trial date. 
It's almost like I had a room service. <laughs> I think about it, God provided. It's almost like God says, see, I am with you, Kenneth. I, am, I know the craving of your heart, even craving of your stomach, <laughs> because I made you. Be strong, be courageous. On the trial, I received 15 years of hard labor sentence. I was the first American one sent to uh, labor camp in North Korea in 2013. Um, and when I got there, I realized that this was only for foreigners only prison. So I got there, I saw 30 or guard or staff, many people working there. I was the only prisoner there for a time. And then, so I have to work from 8 o'clock in the morning until 6 in the evening every day for six days weeks. It's hard labor camp, so I had to do hard labor, doing uh, farming work and all kind of, uh, you know, the digging rock and carrying rock and digging. I mean, there's many different type of form of the labor that you can imagine. Sometimes 38 degrees Celsius uh, or so you drink. So I've been working on the outside. I drank like maybe like a 10 liters of uh, water. Never go to the bathroom at all because I all come out and sweat. So, and then in, in the in, uh, winter time, it's sometimes minus 17 degrees Celsius. Uh, it's really difficult to work outside. But midst of all those things, God is continuing to say, I am with you, Lord. In the evening, I, my back was hurting, my leg was hurting. I just couldn't even open my eyes. And then when I go to sleep, they have light on. It's hard to go to sleep with light on. And then in the in summertime, it's very hot and sticky in, in the room. Humi humidity is very high. Um, but there's no, uh, you, know, you know, pretty much no screen, you know, in, on the window. So if I open the window, all the bugs come in because my room was only room has a light on all, on the whole building. So I have, to, I have to kill about 200 bucks a day, you know. I had authorized pains and I have to shake my, I have to get up every hour, sh you know, shake my hand like this. And it was just very difficult to endure. Midst of that, so I asked the Lord, Lord, how long, Lord, will suffering work last? But this is what the Lord said, Lord. Even suffering is beneficial for you. I didn't like his answer. <laughs> I want to go home. Why don't you, why don't you just you know, end the off, and you can end my suffering by taking me home. But instead, it says, even suffering is beneficial for you. But through the suffering, I learned to fix my eye upon the Lord. I learned to trust the Lord more. And without the suffering, probably I don't have a chance to even come and share what I'm sharing today. But at that time, I didn't understand why I need to go through this suffering. Even lower say, I'll be your rescuers. I was, and all those things, and uh, God has continued to show his power and presence and his provisions. I was... Um, Working outside, uh, digging the, I was, I was working on the bean field and I'd never done farming before in my life. So, but my bean field was on the hill, it was half rock, half soil. It wasn't even place to, you know, and to grow anything. But I was working there and then the warden of the prison walking by saw me working and say, uh, you know, and then, have you not done farming before in, my, in your life? I said, never. I said, how do you survive without knowing farming? I said, well, farmers grow, you know, crops and you know, fishermen, you know, catch fish. I just go to the supermarket. Yeah. <laughs> And, uh, and then I say, you know, then, you know, if you, then uh, how do you make, how do you survive? How do you make a living? I say, I just, I make a living by talking because <laughs> I'm a missionary. And so I was talking like that and he said, look at our field, how wonderful our field is. There's a field in the, in the bottom that has, their, they're growing their crop, there are their bean fields there. And then my field is over there because they have to grow their own food because government is not giving them anything. So even God have to do farming on that side. And I said, how wonderful our field is, how terrible your field is. And I was saying that, as I say, Eve, uh, farming, you need help from heaven, don't you? And as I say, what do you mean by that? I said, well, you need rain, you need wind, temperatures, all those things. And then he said, no, we don't need uh, help from heaven or God. We have a special methodology taught by our Kim Il-sung himself. As long as we follow his principle, we are fine. We don't need a God or heaven to help us. And he just took off, with, you know, just a bad. And that night, suddenly I was about to sleep, heavy rain came down. 
And there was commotion happening in the prison. Next day morning, I went out, and uh, I saw Warden walking by. He was very, very down. And I said, what happened last night? Oh, heavy rain came down. All our beam field is underwater. I saw their beam field. Everything's underwater. I saw mine is fine. <laughs> It's on the hill, it's on the bottom, you know. And I look at it both, and I look at it both, and I say, Lord, you're funny. <laughs> <laughs> and he was looking at it, and I said, wow, maybe, maybe there is a God. <laughs> and then he walked away. So he showed the presence and power and provisions. And on the Sunday, I'm sitting in the chair. I have to watch TV all day long about Kim Jong-il, Kim Il-sung. So I was just daydreaming about food because I was hungry in North Korea prison. Prison, they just give you soup and rice and a couple of vegetables. That's it. So after you work for an hour or two, I'm always hungry. So I'm, I'm always hungry. So I was daydreaming about what I want to eat this time. I was thinking about... First thing craving was Hawaiian chocolate with macadamia nut. <laughs> uh, two was Kit Kat. Three was beef jerky from the US. Four was protein bar, energy bar. Five, fifth was, uh, you know, mixed nut. But where can I get Hawaiian chocolate in North Korean prison? So I just, I just didn't even pray, I just smiled. And about a couple of months later, I was sent to the hospital because of my nutrition. I lost more than 27 kilos in three months of working in the labor camp. So I was in hospital uh, recovering, and this is when my mom came to visit me from Seattle, Washington. Today's Mother's Day here. Imagine, this was, you can, this was five years ago, 2013, she came to visit me. And I, I, you know, imagine you are mom having your son in North Korea prison, and then now you now you're lost so much weight, and then the son is in the hospital. And she came to see me, it was an emotional reunion. And the second day she uh, came back, we were talking and said, oh, by the way, I brought you something. She took out her bag. First thing she took out was Hawaiian chocolate with macadamia nut. <laughs> Second thing was Kit Kat. <laughs> Third thing was beef jerky. Fourth thing was, what do you think? Protein bar. The fifth thing was mixed nut. So, hey, I have chocolate here. <laughs> and a protein bar like this. I didn't pray. I didn't ask anybody. I didn't write to my mom. I didn't call my mom and say, can I have some chocolate? And I didn't actually even forgot the fact that I thought about these things. But God remembered. Our God is good at all the time. Even in the most difficult places, God is still good. So it wasn't about so much about chocolate. But it was the fact that he cares about me. The fact that he's with me. He knows even you know, the craving of, just thought about wow, how it would be nice to have a Hawaiian chocolate. And God, remember, as a here is your surprise. So we sang a song today, Christ is more than enough for me. And that was the moment that I said that prayer to the Lord. Lord, you are more than enough. You are worth living my life for, even even going to prison for, that you love me this much. And then there was an um, the, um, attempt by North, uh, U.S. governments to try to send a special envoy. It was canceled, it was canceled or failed. And then last minute, the, uh, there was one person from White House showed up and said, I thought he said, I'm here to get you. Let's go home. But you know what he said? I'm sorry. And he left. He's from White House, National Secure, Security Council. Very famous guy who came to see me. It was a secret visit. No one knew about it because it was failed missions. And then my mother's letters arrived. Kenneth, you need a faith like a Daniel three friends. You know, our God is able to save us even if he does not. You need that kind of faith. So I realized, I knew exactly that I was not going home anytime soon. I was already the longest held uh, American prisoner there in North Korean custodies. And so I had to, I, have to, I just, just, there's one thought that came to me. Because for a long time, I've wanted to ask God for this question. One is that 
Lord, do you want me to stay here? Is this your will for me to be here in North Korea? But I could not ask that question because I did not want that answer. I want to go home. But for three weeks, I've been pondering, pondering. I finally lay down on my hospital bed, and I pray, Lord, Lord, you know my heart. I want to go home, but not my will, but your will be done, Lord. I give up my right to go home. Use me, Lord. It was very, very difficult. Probably the most difficult prayer I ever prayed in my life. And the Lord spoke to me clearly. Kenneth, do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than your wife, your children, your ministry, everything you've been living for? I know deep down in my heart, I don't love him as much as he loves me. But I say, yes, Lord. And this is when he said, then feed my sheep, take care of my lamb. There are more than 30 or 40 people around me in prison, the hospital, and elsewhere. And I only saw them as oppressor, their guard, they're doing, you know, you know, you're, you're talking about prison in North Korea. You know, they are, not everybody is nice, you know. All those people are there. But so whenever I've been praying every day, save me, Lord. Um, then I just saw, only saw them as oppressor. But when I, after I pray, use me, Lord. And the Lord said, these are my sheep that I have sent you as a shepherd. You are my son representing my kingdom here in prison. And so I asked the Lord, help me, Lord. Help me. How am I supposed to do this, Lord? And Lord started to open the door. My prison number was 103. And they only call me by the prison number. That was my name at the time. But when nobody's around, one by one, they start coming to me as a pastor. Can I talk to you? Can I talk? And they're talking about their family problem, marriage issue. Yes, even North Korea has a marriage problem there. <laughs> and then they have a children problem issues. I'm doing a family counseling, marriage counselings, and premarital counselings. And, and then I started to become their friends and their shepherds. One person, one of the guards asked me this question. Pastor, if I believe in God like you, what do I, if I believe in God like you, what do I get? Is that any, what, what benefit is there? Another guy said, if I believe in God like you, what do I have to pay to your church? You're talking about obligation and the price need to be paid. And then I said, yes, there is financial you know, donation and offering, but more importantly, you need to give your life to God. I was there for two years, and then one of the guards told me, you say God is real. How come you're still here then? How come God, you say God, you pray, and God answer your prayer. How come you are, you've been here for the longest, you've been here, uh, going back and forth hospital. How do you explain that? And I said, maybe God has a different plan. Maybe that plan may include you. Without me, how are you going to hear about God or anything from outside? He said, it's true. I never heard anything like this before in my life. When I was being interrogated in the first month, one of the, the investigators asked me these questions. I heard about God before, never heard about Jesus before. So tell me where does Jesus live, in China or North Korea? And I said, I said are you kidding? But he said, he was born in Pyongyang. He went to college in Pyongyang. This is an educated 30-some-year-old investigator from National School Bureau asking me genuinely and say, where does Jesus live? How is it possible? Pyongyang used to be the Jerusalem of the Far East. Name of Jesus disappeared in North Korea. 25 million people living in North Korea living without able to hear name Jesus. In the entire earth, North Korea is the only place in earth like this. Any Muslim country, any places in Africa, now you have satellite, now you have internet, now you have phone call you can make, you can travel to outside. Only North Korea is like this. No way to travel, no way to get on the internet. Unless someone go there and tell them about Jesus, there's no way to find out. We're talking about unification, peaceful process, all wonderful. However, for us as a Christian, Unification is the only way to ensure for them to hear the name Jesus. It's not about for them to become Christian. It's about for them to have access to the name of Jesus will be through the unifications. So the role reminded me, before me, they were not able to know, hear anything about God. 
If I go home right away, then they're not going to be able to know the Lord. How am I supposed to do this, Lord? And Lord reminded me this illustration. It's about the missionaries who went to India in a rural village in, in, a, in a minority tribe. And he was working there, but his language skill was not great. And then also the local dialect was very difficult to learn. So he was there three years, five years, but not able to preach the gospel. After being there for 10 years, sending church asked him to come back. They sent another missionary there in his place. And this young missionary, very gifted in linguistics, and after being there for three years so he was able to preach the gospel so he said okay now I'm gonna preach the gospel he got everybody together in the village he spoke he preached the gospel first time and he asked everybody who who want to believe in Jesus raise your hand then everybody raised their hand they said okay I, maybe I made a mistake here so let me explain to you once again he preached the gospel another time and then I said okay now understand right only people want to believe in Jesus raise your hand Everybody raised their hand again. So he was frustrated and said, do you really know who Jesus is? And the village chief raised his hand and said, Jesus was with us for 10 years. He, the Lord reminded me of the illustration when I was in North Korea prison. He said, I may be the only Jesus they will ever get to see in their entire lifetime. Be a little Jesus to them. But it's a prison. How am I supposed to do this? So every morning I pray, Lord, help me to live like you, Lord Jesus. Help me to not dishonor your name today. Because some people will yell. Some people will say, do this, do that. Um, you know, like so sit down and get up and all kinds of things that I have to go through every day. How am I supposed to live like Jesus in this place? That was a very difficult challenge. So I'm working on the field. But I have to do, demonstrate the love of Jesus Christ with them. So on one day in the winter, the, um, there was a news came and said, in two days, U.S. envoy is coming to get you home. So get ready. You know, I said, finally, I'm going home. I said, yes. I told everybody, thank you so much, everybody. I'm going home now. And I was even sang a song. I was so excited. I said, you know, It's like, hey, farewell, everybody. We'll see you next time. You know. And then and they say, please. And I say, hey, why, don't, why do you want to go home so early? You should stay longer. We like you having you here. <laughs> don't go so early. But in two days, U.S. envoy never showed up. It was canceled by North Korean governments. I was devastated. I was, my hope was crushed. I realized that giving up right to go home is not something you do it one time. You have to do it every day. Choosing to love God more is not doing it one time. You need to do it every day. In the evenings, I have nothing to do because after dinner, I'm supposed to sit in the chair and the light goes out for a couple of hours. So in the complete dark, I'm sitting, only thing I could do was singing to the Lord. I love you, Lord, you know, and there's none like you. And I'm singing all this song. And there is a hymn, there is a Korean hymn song talking about whether we live, whether we live in the shack, living in the palace, with Jesus with me, this is where heaven is. I'm singing this song. There, everybody can hear the singing of the American prisoner because in the, this is a countryside in the nighttime. And they were hearing my song and they said, you are very strange. They come to me and say, we are the guard, you are the prisoner, how come you look happier than us? Where does your joy come from? Where does your home come from? I said, it comes come from God. When I left, uh, prison, the, um, when I left, warden of the prison, the same warden said, you don't need a God shook my hand and said, one word, see you again. But he was, I saw tears in his eyes. So I realized that God was doing something while I was in North Korea. So when I came back, I, would, I, I told my family, I'm so glad to be back, but I felt sad because I'm thinking about the people I left behind. I felt like a shepherd leaving the sheep behind in the wilderness. But I cannot ask any of my friends and say, who would go and shepherd them in, the, in a prison in my, in, instead of me? I cannot ask any of the family to go through what I went through. But later on, a few months later, Pastor Lim Hyun Su from Canada was detained. And he was sent to the same prison. He, he, was, he served 
he was sentenced to life in prison. He was in exactly the same room that I was in for two and a half years. Pastor Lim Hyun Soo is a past, senior pastor of the largest Korean church in Canada. He's been to North Korea 150 times. He loved Jesus. He loved North Korean people. And he's a pastor, real pastor. <laughs> was there ministering to. So he became a pastor for North Korea prison, I believe. And he came back. After he came back, three Americans were detained in North Korea. Actually, there were four. One came back last year. His name is Otto Wombier. He came back, he died after six days later. I met his parents in Geneva uh, in last February. And I, I, I do believe that, uh, because today is Mother's Day, for so parents thinking about uh, son, it'll be extremely difficult. Because I came back, three other Americans came back couple of days ago. Can you imagine seeing these people coming back, <coughs> rejoicing, reuniting the family member? I didn't understand at the time there was such a blessing to be back. So I just um, fast forward here. November 3rd, 2014 was two year anniversaries that I was there. November 1st, the prosecutor came to me, came to see me and say, you've been here for two years, you have to be here 13 more years, no one's coming for you, your government abandoned you, you are not going home. But you've been saying this for every week, for every, uh, one year. So I nicknamed him Mr. Disappointment <laughs> because he always said disappointing news. So I have to choose whether to listen to him. More than 450 letters arrived. People around the world and said, Kenneth, you are not forgotten. We are standing with you. We are praying for you. You will come home soon. So I read all those letters. And I reminded myself, I had to remind myself, looking at the mirror every day and say, my name is Kenneth Bay. I'm a missionary. So I'm here for the reason. And then on November 3rd, Monday, two-year anniversary, God woke me up in the morning, and he said, open your Bible to Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 20. He said in English, and I had my NIV Bible with me. I opened it. He said, I will bring you home. That was Monday. Friday, U.S. envoy arrived. Saturday, I was on the way home. On the way home, I told the people who came on the, um, on the envoy, and I said, Lord spoke to me on Monday, November 3rd, that he was going to send me home, bring me home. And they were so surprised. We left Washington, D.C. Monday, November 3rd. God spoke to me, sent U.S. government plane over to get me home. Our God is good. Yeah. Praise the Lord. And so when I, on the way, after I came back, I told everybody that even President Obama knows my name. More importantly, Heavenly Father knows my name. Heavenly Father knows your name, all of your name, going, know what you're going through, how difficult trial you may be enduring. But Lord is saying the same thing to me and to you. He is with us. And you'll never leave us, never forsake us. Cast your, your anxieties upon him because he do cares for us. When I came back, I realized that I was able to fix my eye upon the Lord. I was able to trust the Lord. I was able to learn to love God, even time of travel and difficulty. And also, the Lord taught me how to obey the Lord, even time of difficulties. I came back, the Lord reminded me that people around the world remembered you. I remembered you. And I have not forgotten the people of North Korea either. I will rest restore them once again. So go and tell the people around the world what I've done for you. Tell the people, as people pray, 177,000 people signed the petition for my release. And millions of people pray for me around the world. And as they pray that I was able to come home. So 
go tell them, we pray God will deliver, God will rescue 25 million North Korean people as God rescued me. And he will restore the people. He will rebuild the people's so life once again. So here, are, this is why that I decided to come and speak to you this morning and letting you know that our God is real. He's a living God who now only care for missionary like me or three other missionaries just came back. But 25 million people do not have access to the name of Jesus. And we need to see the wall need to come down. And it will come down. So 2018 is exactly 70 years since 1948. So 70 years is, is the past. So we, um, today we didn't have a chance to talk about the Nehemiah much. But I will just summarize really quickly for you. When Nehemiah, in front of the Bible, was working at the palace in Babylon, and he heard the news, what happened to, what's happening in Jerusalem. When he realized the wall is torn down, the, the gate is burned down, and people are suffering and living in shame, he felt such compassion. He was such a, and then he, he just fell and cried and cried. He wept and cried out to God. And like, Lord, have mercy upon my people, Lord. We have sinned against you, Lord. But you are great, merciful God. We turn our way. We've turned back to you. You will heal our land, heal our people. Listen to us. Listen to our cry. You know what happened to his cry in his, his, um, you know, his prayer? His prayer moved the heart of God. And God moved the heart of the king. And the king sent Nehemiah to go and rebuild the wall and restore the city of Jerusalem once again. And the worship was restored. Uh, word was, the scripture was restored. And then later on, Jerusalem became again the sanctuary for the Israel. And 400 years later, Jesus came to Jerusalem. Well, you're living here in South Korea. Many of you are from, from over, you know, overseas. You're here for the reason. As you saw the summit, North and South Korea summit, you will see uh, North and U.S. summit soon. What is your expectation that will happen this year? When I was in North Korea, the Lord reminded me that 2018 will be a year of breakthrough. Get ready for 2018. I've been telling people ever since I came back, is that something will happen in 2018. We'll break the door to leading into unification. We, want, we don't want just peace, but unification will allow the people in North Korea to be truly free, to be able to know, worship the Lord. When I came back, uh, we're just going to show the video for you because we, I think we have time's up here. Um, I'm gonna, when I came back, um, this is uh, what I've been doing is I've been telling the people around the world, let's remember the people in North Korea, let's do something about it, what we can hear. We can work with the refugees that were leaving the North Korea in China, in South Korea. Let's see what we can do. And then Lord uh, brought me to this point to start this ministry. So quickly we'll show you and then we will end it here. been traveling over 17 different countries I spoke to hundreds of thousands of people last several years asking people to remember the people in North Korea together as in Nehemiah prayed and worship and ask the Lord to uh, restore to Jerusalem once again. And the Lord has done his job through Nehemiah. Many people uh, stood with Nehemiah and rebuilt, rebuilt the wall, restored the Jerusalem. So we started at the 1 million Nehemiah 
prayer petition campaign. More than 177,000 people signed the petition for me. So I'm asking for one missionary, if the people can do that, how about millions of people around the world sign prayer petition to the Lord? They say, I will remember them, I will pray for them. So you're, you're, you're looking at, this is um, Brazil. Now people in Brazil are praying and say, we will stand with the people in North Korea. Now we're doing it in Hong Kong, in China, US, in different places, in Europe. So right now, people, there's more than 26 countries, 240 different cities. People are praying and remembering the people of North Korea since the January this year. We are now um, helping people with um, refugees here and here as well with people living in North Korea by sending rice, sending Bible, sending USB stick with the, you know, with the Jesus film in it. And now we are mainly, we've been doing the work with re rescuing refugees. More than 100,000 people in, uh, living in China. Many of them still need to be rescued to come here. Because when they get caught, uh, they get sent back to North Korea. They are facing hard time labor for at least five to seven years now. We have an orphanage set up in China to help with North Korean children who are born in uh, China because they were sold as a bribe. But mother was taken back to North Korea and they died there. So now the kids become orphans. We're helping them with orphanage. And we're also starting the gospel radio campaign so that people in North Korea cannot hear the gospel there. So we're gonna uh, read the Bible to them so that they will hear the name of Jesus to them. We're also preparing for um, the, the Bible, special edition Bible called Urimar Songgyong, is a Korean edition, but it's, it's for North and South Korea. And so we are going to deliver the Bible to North Korea when doors open. First month, we want to deliver one million Bible uh, to North Korea, so then one million family will have a Bible in the, once the door is open. We have a North Korea Mission Training Academy, and so that's what we've been doing. So this year, um, we are actually located in Yangje. This is where our prayer gathering every Tuesday night is. You are welcome to come and pray with us. And also, we do have a trainings for North Korea Mission candidates. We have uh, English ministries for those of them, those of, the, a lot of uh, refugees come, they need to learn the English. Many of you, um, all of you speak English here, so you're welcome to volunteer teach uh, English also, as we have English camp coming up in the Jeju Island this uh, July for unification camp for North and South and people from outside are coming. We'll be sharing gospel with them, for first, and then they'll be able to, we're, we are trying to restore their life together. We, our motto is we stand with North Korean refugees because refugees who are coming here need help. Most help is needed. I just wanted to end it with this. Last week, we took three or four of the North Korean refugees to East Coast because they just got out and they wanted to see, one person said, I want to see the, uh, the, the ocean. He had, she hasn't seen the ocean for seven years. So we went there, to South Korean, North Korean, Americans, we all got together and we just went there. It was short, one, one night and two days trips. Just spending time with them and just one day, it broke a lot of barriers. Now they're all communicating. We're seeing each other once again. They're coming to prayer meetings. They're coming to our care meetings. And just for spending a one day together, total stranger, we're meeting for the first time. If we can do that, just spending a small amount of time, what will happen when doors open? We need to be ready to go and share the gospel with the people in North Korea. So we are preparing the people here. Let's spend time here working with North Korean refugees here in South Korea. So we have a prayer, uh, you know, these letters. You can go to prayer number four, nk.org, sign online. Maybe the easiest way to do so. If you have given this brochure or if you want more information, you can take it in the back. There's a way to, uh, if you want to support, you can wait to, there is a way to uh, donate and support as well. But more importantly, I'm asking you, to remember the people in North Korea as you remember me. Many of you pray for me. I just want to say thank you. Because of your prayer, I am able to come back to stand here with you. So let's go ahead and stand with the people in North Korea together. May the Lord bless you. Amen.